Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Native Security Con, and welcome to our talk on what is zero trust or what is a zero trust tunnel. We're going to dive into ambient mesh and how we're able to pr provide a simpler approach to security operations with ambient mesh. Come on, work. Go ahead. There we go. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Barton. I'm a field engineer uh, here in North America with Solo, and uh, yeah, happy to be here this morning. Awesome. I'm Marino Widjay. I am a platform advocate at Solo. Uh, there's a lot of things you could do. You could follow me if you want. But one thing I will say is, if you're kind of new to the Istio journey or the service mesh journey, I run something called 70 Days of Service Mesh, and I'm doing this on GitHub. You can follow along. I basically will dive into various topics of the world of service mesh and, and Istio and even application networking. So go check that out. But we're going to dive right into it. You might have heard of something called Ambient Mesh, which was announced last year as a joint effort between Solo and Google. And what it really is, is a new mode of operation uh, within Istio or within the Istio service mesh, which offers up a sidecarless approach. So within Istio today, you would normally deploy something called a sidecar resource alongside your, your main application container because it behaves as the proxy to process requests, process policies, uh, provide a level of telemetry, and whatnot. But there are certain applications out there that don't really benefit from it and actually are hurt by it. So for example, sometimes you may be experiencing things like a race condition between one of your applications trying to come online before a sidecar comes online. So you can't quite get um, your application up and, on, and online. So you have to tune this and uh, set something like a, there's a field called the hold application timer within your deployment so that you can ensure that your sidecar comes up online first. There's also some other elements like the server send first protocols like SQL and, and other you know, data, database style of applications, and they don't play nicely with the Istio service mesh with the sidecar or using any sort of sidecar for communications. So this is where ambient mesh shines because it provides a, an opportunity to simplify that operation altogether. Um, what that means is while you still get the, the benefits and the capabilities of a service mesh, the function of the sidecar shifts away from the actual application and moves towards two components. We've actually broken this down into layer four and layer seven. So the two components are, are known as the Z-Tunnel and the Waypoint Proxy. That, that Z-Tunnel, what we're really here to talk about, the Zero Trust Tunnel, is what's doing a lot of the activity for tunneling requests between one particular service over to another service, maybe within the same node or in another node. Now, the reality here is that um, you know, not all applications are going to require the sidecar. Some will require the sidecar. But not only that, what, what happens when you need some sort of layer seven style of policy? So this is where that waypoint proxy comes into effect here to basically come in and say, let's act on that policy whenever there is one that comes about. We'll talk a little bit more about how that all flows. Uh, but the mode of operation changes here. The direction of traffic changes. And this means that we can provide uh, Istio or service mesh-like capabilities for workloads that don't need the sidecar, whereas we can also provide it for workloads that do take advantage of the sidecar. There's also some other interesting components around how we route traffic within, let's say, an ambient mesh environment. So we deploy something called a CNI node pod that uh, is deployed as a daemon set alongside the Z-Tunnel. The Z-Tunnel is also deployed as a daemon set. Now, if you've ever worked with IPsec before, there's something interesting that goes on. You have to define an access control list that tells the tunnel, hey, this is the traffic we're going to encrypt. This is the source traffic we're going to encrypt. This is how we also operate in the world of ambient mesh. We have traffic that is tagged towards the Z-Tunnel pod that's going to tunnel over to another node. And once we've identified what that traffic is, it's encrypted, it's sent across the tunnel, and uh, it gets to its destination. So, the same process flows for when we're having to do this with, uh, let's say, a waypoint proxy. But we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But when we look at it at a deeper level, we have two services, service A and service B. When I have traffic that's destined from service A to service B, that traffic is going to go towards the Z-Tunnel, which used to be the sidecar. That Z-Tunnel will actually derive identity from that workload and use it to form its end of MTLS. The destination does the exact same, so now you have end-to-end -end MTLS between these Z-Tunnel pods. This way, 
when your traffic or your requests are going through, they're going to still maintain their, their encryption all the way through to the, uh, the destination. Now, actually, one other thing I will point out, though, is that this is strictly layer four. So if I'm just doing strict layer four communications, TCP or UDP style of communications, then I only need the Z-Tunnel object or the, the Z-Tunnel pod that gets deployed per node. When I, need, when I need layer seven authorization, for example, this is where the waypoint proxy comes in. We deploy this at the destination side so that as traffic is coming in or as layer seven requests are coming in, that waypoint proxy is supposed to sit there and and analyze those requests, and then we'll allow that request to flow through or deny it altogether or provide some sort of response to the originator. Now, the other interesting thing, though, about the Waypoint Proxy is that it actually makes use of the gateway API spec in Kubernetes. So you specify a gateway class, um, which I think Jim is going to show you a little bit later on when we get into the demo, and that acts as our enforcement point for Layer 7. Now, one other interesting thing about this is that the Waypoint Proxy still uses Envoy because Envoy is the most performant Layer 7 proxy that we know of and that we've used alongside Istio for a very, very long time. Now, what are the benefits of using Ambient Mesh? So you cut back on race conditions like I mentioned earlier on, but then you also have to think about this, this idea of sidecar injection. It no longer is there, which means that you can easily onboard services into a mesh without having to roll them out again and restart that deployment. The other thing, too, is when you have to upgrade, let's say, a sidecar, or now more specifically, a Z-Tunnel, you're not having to do this on a per pod basis. You just do this at the Z-Tunnel level. So that way, you're cutting back on your overall upgrade parameters in terms of how many objects you have to upgrade. The other thing, too, is you're also limiting your blast radius overall in terms of who gets affected, in terms of your configuration. Let's just say you, you applied a configuration that accidentally applied to all of your sidecars, and now all of a sudden you've locked out all of your services and they cannot communicate with each other. That could, that could actually be thwarted with something like ambient mesh and using the Z-Tunnel. The other thing, too, is with respect to cost savings and resource consumption. Because you're not deploying sidecar resources everywhere and only where you need it, you're now consuming less CPU and memory, and even not having to worry about the additional configuration that goes alongside those services. And then this, all of this actually works to contribute to providing that zero trust network. Now let's take a quick look at things like how do we derive identity and what actually goes on with this tunneling. So like I previously showed you, I have a service, service A or app A, that's trying to communicate with app B over on the right-hand side. Now, we already know that because these two workloads are tagged for ambient-based traffic or ambient-based workloads, we already know to put that traffic or that request into the Z-Tunnel and then encrypt it with MTLS. The other thing, though, is that, you know, what is this tunnel? Like, where did this com tunnel come from? So there was a lot of engineering effort that went in to create this new overlay called HBone, or the HTTP-based overlay network encapsulation. And what this provides is a, a TCP over HTTP mechanism so that you can carry your, your requests over this overlay network or this overlay tunnel. Now, this is occurring from Z-Tunnel pod to Z-Tunnel pod. So remember, we deploy a Z-Tunnel pod at a, at a daemon set level. So if your, node, sorry, if your cluster, your Kubernetes cluster, has you know, 10 nodes, each one of those nodes is going to get a Z-Tunnel pod, which means that each one of those Z-Tunnel pods is going to tunnel to each other when there is traffic going over that wire. Now, there's the element of identity. Now, the Z-Tunnel itself actually impersonates the identity of that workload. So if app A is trying to communicate with app B, normally if we had the sidecar, the sidecar itself would assume the identity um, using that spiffy ID format and then you know, would form its MTLS and this would happen on the other end as well. In the case of Z-Tunnel, that identity is actually derived from the actual workload itself, so the Z-Tunnel will impersonate that workload for that request flow. Now, this is also where we can apply our layer four authorization policy. So if you're very familiar with how you can work with firewalls, I look at this as more of a layer four, layer three firewall, because now I could just go ahead and say, I'm gonna, a certain set of workloads have this label. We're lo really looking at it at a TCP IP layer. We're not looking at it at any, you know, at layer seven, so we can implement a, kind of like a firewall policy to say, this service can't talk to that service, and we could do this repeatedly if we wanted to. Now, how does Z-Tunnel actually get the certificate? 
So Zetel will actually solicit the workload for its service account token. Once it gets that, it actually goes to Istio D, the Istio D control plane, and says, hey, I am, I am actually a Z tunnel on this node, and I'm trying to impersonate, or I'm trying to service this identity for this particular workload. Can you run through the certificate uh, signing request for me and issue me a certificate and say, we're all good to go? And once Istio D is able to authorize that, and because of all the trust that's already built in, it says, sure, let's go ahead and do it. It'll issue its identity for that particular workload, and it'll do so for the other end, and then we'll proceed to create that MTLS end-to-end, um, -end, or that MTLS encryption end-to-end. -end. Now, if we have multiple workloads, that same Z tunnel pod is gonna service all of these different workloads that exist on, let's say, that node. And this, you know, you might wonder, okay, what happens when we have many, many kinds of workloads running? Well, there are different ways to scale that we're investigating. One thing I will point out, Istio Ambient Mesh is still experimental. It's not ready for production, but the reason I say that is because we're still testing, we're still scale testing, we're still validating various kinds of use cases that we can achieve with, um, with Ambient Mesh. So in the failure scenario here, let's say that this Z tunnel pod went down, what would happen? Well, Kubernetes will try to reconcile that. But why did that pod go down? Did the node go down? Did the node get disconnected from the actual network? There are a lot of different reasons and varying failure conditions that could have contributed to that failure. Now, um, how am I doing for time? I just want to make sure, okay, all right, because I got to make sure I give uh, Jim his time for his demo. Now, in the situation where I want to implement layer seven authorization policies, I have to deploy a waypoint proxy, like I mentioned previous, previously before. What that means is I have to deploy a, um, a gateway API resource specifically for the waypoint proxy for the destination workload, where I'm trying to communicate towards. And then I'll go about creating my layer seven authorization policy. When I create that policy, it could be, you know, service A or app A can only communicate and make HTTP get requests towards app B, but not delete requests. And as long as that policy is put into, a, you know, into effect and, and deployed, what ends up happening is that Z tunnel pod on the source of that traffic will encrypt using MTLS towards the waypoint proxy. The waypoint proxy will derive the, the identity of the destination workload, much like it would do for the Z tunnel. And then it would tunnel to the Z tunnels on the destination node, and then that Z tunnel will unencrypt the traffic and then direct it towards that final workload. So the request flow changes a little bit because now you're having to go through another proxy, but that's just because we want to enforce layer seven. There's three conditions that I want to talk about in terms of what happens when I have, let's say, an app compromise, uh, let's say a proxy compromise, or even a node compromise? So app compromises can come from a variety of different scenarios. Hey, I pulled down a container that I didn't realize was malicious, and now it's in my environment. That can contribute to your app compromise. So maybe you need to be thinking about, you know, how do I prevent us from pulling down containers that we shouldn't be pulling down and deploying into our environment? Um, when it comes to when it comes to the proxy itself, the original sidecar proxy has so many different um, ways to you know, create policy, ways to tune it. There are a lot of different observability filters that you can tap into. And this is great for the sidecar because it provides all of that functionality. But one of the, the biggest challenges here is these are all the different points of attack or points of potential vulnerability. Now, if we slim down that proxy to just doing layer four and MTLS, then we can remove all the additional features and we can just secure that surface area significantly. So this way we have a smaller exposure area and we limit ourselves to you know, the attack surface altogether. And then there's the final piece of node compromise. So node compromise is interesting because I get that question a lot. All right. I have an app that's going to be talking to the Z tunnel to you know, forward requests over. That communication between, let's say, that pod and that Z tunnel pod is not encrypted. OK, that's great. That's, that's, that's wonderful. But here's the other thing. Why does someone have access to your node? Why do they have root access? You know, this, isn't, this is more of a physical control situation. This is more of a role-based access control situation. Do you have those proper policies in place to prevent people from being able to even get into your node? Are you using secure operating systems or even secure distributions to run your clusters? So there are other considerations to think about 
other than the fact that App A and the Z Tunnel don't have encrypted communications. If someone gets you know, access to your nodes, you're in a lot more trouble than what we're seeing here. And with that, that actually gives me the opportunity to pass it over to Jim to do that little demo. Thanks, Jim. All right, thank you, Marino. Um, so I don't know about you, but I'm someone who really enjoys uh, not just hearing about how things work, but actually seeing how they work. And so we're going to uh, we're going to do that here with with a brief demonstration of uh, of ambient mesh um, in the uh, in the time we have remaining. And uh, uh, so we're, we're actually going to uh, start from the, uh, from the, basically from the ground up, okay? We've done a little bit of pre-installation here. Um, you can see we have, a, uh, we have a kind cluster, has four nodes on it. There's a, a, a control plane node. Uh, there are three worker nodes that are, uh, uh, that, that are active here. And um, so what we've done is we've, we've uh, uh, there's actually a script that goes along with this. If you're interested in, in learning more, you can actually follow along with this exercise and, and do a lot more uh, than just what we're going to accomplish here in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, by going to academy.solo.io. Look for this ambient mesh uh, course right here. It's all perfectly free, and uh, uh, you can actually go through this exercise on, on your own time and, uh, and dive into it a little more uh, deeply. So at this point, we have a, uh, we have a four node uh, cluster that's here. We've deployed that. Um, and uh, we, have also, we have also deployed Istio. Now at this point, Ambient is not the uh, default mode for Istio. As, as Marino said, Ambient is still, is still experimental. Uh, it's one of the top priorities for the Istio community this year to, to get it hardened and get it production ready, but at this point it's not. So, uh, so we've actually installed uh, the Ambient profile in, uh, in Istio, which gives us, uh, it gives us the, uh, the Istio D uh, control plane, kind of core Istio capabilities. It gives us an ingress gateway and also the CNI components that, uh, uh, that, that uh, Marino mentioned that's responsible for redirecting traffic between the, uh, uh, the, work, the workloads and the, uh, and the Z tunnels that actually manage the layer four policy, uh, policy enforcement, okay? So we've, uh, we've, done that, uh, we've done that installation. You can actually see the, um, the pods that are, uh, that are available here. So here are, the, um, here are the Istio system pods. You can see there's the Istio CNI node. It's deployed as a daemon set. So you can see we have one per node. Uh, we also have the Z tunnel components that have been deployed as well. Now at this point, they're not really doing anything because we haven't activated ambient uh, for any of our application workspaces, but they're there. There's one deployed per node. They're ready to. Uh, they're ready to go. And you can also see we have deployed some workloads that we're going to be um, using in this exercise. So to 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 accomplish that, we we have a little simulation of an e-commerce system. You can see this diagram at the right. There are three components here. Uh, there's a web API, there's a recommendation service, and there is a purchase history service. Now, these services aren't really real. We're using a, a little framework called the fake service that allows us to just uh, uh, basically uh, uh, test policy enforcement against the, the communication as it happens across, uh, across the different service boundaries. And basically, when you hit each service, what you're going to get back is just a kind of an echo message that says, hey, you're in the purchase history service now, and, and that sort of thing. So that's... Uh, that's our, that's our application workload, if you will. We also have a couple of client pods that we have deployed here. Uh, there's one called Sleep and one called Not Sleep. You'll, you'll see those uh, be activated in just a bit, okay? Uh, we have also, we're also using just standard Istio APIs to expose uh, these workloads to the outside world. Uh, if you're familiar with Istio, there's nothing, there's nothing exotic or unusual here at all. Uh, we're just using, uh, we basically have a, uh, we have a gateway component that uh, we've defined that just says, hey, we're listening in on the host Istio explain.io on port 80 with HTTP. And then we're also establishing a virtual service to route traffic that's intended for that domain to our web API service, which is kind of the, uh, uh, the, head, of our, the head of our application chain uh, that we are using here. Okay, so once we have once we have all of that in place, we can do uh, just some simple tests here. So 
this is one we're actually going to go through the, uh, through the gateway, uh, through, through the Istio Ingress gateway coming from outside the cluster. It's going to route to the Web API service, which is in turn going to invoke all of the others uh, in the chain. And you can see that when we, when we call that here, um, there is our Web API response, and you can see it makes some upstream calls. One of those is the recommendation service. The recommendation service, in turn, makes a call upstream to the, to the purchase history service. So a pretty simple setup. Everything is working. Uh, we have Ambient installed on the cluster, but we've not really activated it yet. And so that's what we're going to do next. So um, we will check that out. Everything should be good. And we will move on. All right, to the next step. So we're going to do a couple of things here. First of all, we're going to add services to the ambient mesh. You're going to see how the activation uh, takes place. Uh, we're going to look at some specific layer four authorization policies, just basic things that you can do that are, that are applied via the Z-Tunnel component. And then finally, we'll show you just a really quick example of a layer seven authorization policy as well. So let's, uh, let's kick off this, um, this exercise, and the first thing we want to do, so we have the ambient profile of Istio installed, but we've not activated it for any of our namespaces yet. So what we're going to do, we're going to label the default namespace, which is where our web API purchase history, our e-commerce application uh, services are deployed. And so once we label that, what's going to happen is we're going to see uh, we're going to see ambient mode be activated for the services in this um, in this workspace. Specifically, you can see that by taking a look at the logs of the CNI node. We won't go into any detail here, but you can see it's recognized. Hey, we're setting up this default namespace. Um, you can see. Um, you can see where some routing rules are being defined here uh, and, and that there are routes that are being added from, the, uh, from the, the, the source workloads and the target workloads to their local, uh, their local Z tunnels, okay? So the nice thing is we're not having to go and restart those components at all. Uh, we're not having to inject um, a sidecar or anything like that, but you can see here for our application pods, um, that we still have a single, you know, there, there, there's no sidecar injected. There's, there's no, there, there aren't two containers uh, that are active within those, uh, within those pods. There's only a single one, and in fact, the Z-Tunnel is handling the, uh, um, the routing of the traffic, okay? So, um, so once we have established that, kind of verified that the, uh, the CNI has, is redirecting our, um, our traffic, um, you actually... What we're, what we're going to do is you'll see the, uh, what, what, what will happen is the traffic's going to look something like what's depicted in that diagram that uh, uh, is very similar to what Marino showed where we're going to have a client app talking to its local Z tunnel. It's going to establish uh, a, an HBOME tunnel to a Z tunnel on the target machine and then it will route traffic to the actual uh, uh, target services. Okay, so no sidecar is required. So if we generate some traffic now to this, um, to this API service, you can actually see what the Z-Tunnel is, um, is doing. So uh, if we take a look at the, um, the Z-Tunnel logs, you can see here's, here's the, uh, the, the HTTP Connect tunnel that's, uh, uh, that's being established here. You can see some of the, uh, the spiffy IDs that indicate things like uh, for example, we're going from the, uh, you know, like from, the, from the web API to the recommendation engine. Um, you can also see here at the very bottom a record where uh, that we're capturing outbound traffic and there's no waypoint proxy that is, uh, that's involved. And that's because all we're doing here is we're just activating the layer four uh, uh, component of the network, right? We're encrypting the traffic. We're using, uh, we're using cryptographic identities to establish the connection uh, uh, between, between the Z-Tunnels and, the, uh, and the, source, uh, the source and destination services, but because there's no layer seven uh, uh, policy that's being applied, we don't have to, we don't have, to uh, have one of those um, activated at this point. So that's an important, 
consideration for a lot of what we see customers who are adopting ambient mesh or adopting Istio, they care primarily about the, uh, um, the security aspects of, uh, of securing the services within their mesh. They don't necessarily need the full layer seven capabilities. And so this gives you a way to incrementally adopt just the components of Istio that you need without biting off the full, uh, uh, the full uh, layer seven model, okay? So we can see there's traffic now going through the, um, through the Z-Tunnel, and now let's actually uh, apply some policies to that, uh, to that traffic. So first we'll start with, uh, you know, good zero trust foundation here. We're gonna start with a policy that basically denies all, uh, denies all traffic, okay? So this is an allow nothing authorization policy. Another thing you might notice is that the, uh, the Istio APIs, we're using standard Istio APIs here. The APIs themselves um, have not changed, it's simply the way the Istio D control plane is, is activating these policies is by programming you know, Z-tunnels and waypoint proxies as opposed to programming sidecars that are attached to each individual workload. So once we establish that allow nothing authorization policy, we'll do the exact same operation we did before that worked fine, and not surprisingly, what's gonna happen is that request is going to be denied. So we will expand out our, our authorization policy again using best, you know, least privilege access sort of practices. We'll establish a suite of policies that basically authorize each link in that service chain. So here is one for the, uh, for the web API component. It's going to allow, um, it's going to allow requests that come from either this, uh, this sleep identity, the sleep pod, or from the Istio Ingress gateway uh, component, all right? So, and then in turn, the next link in the chain, the recommendation service, is only going to allow uh, access from the web API identity. And finally, the third link in the chain, the purchase history component, is only going to allow access from the recommendation service, okay? Pretty straightforward stuff, but gives you a nice uh, policy-based foundation for, um, for establishing this sort of thing. Now, so now what do we expect to happen? If we use that same, uh, um, that same invocation again, in this case, now we expect that it's going to work just fine because we've authorized each link in the, uh, in the service chain, and in fact, that's exactly what you see. We're hitting web API, we're hitting recommendation, and we're hitting purchase history, okay? Now one final step here, and then I'll turn it back over to Marino to wrap up. Um, so we've talked, about, uh, we've talked about the layer four policies, how those are applied via the, via the Z-tunnel. Um, we can also apply layer seven policies for services, for identities, where that makes sense. We can spin up the additional uh, infrastructure to, uh, to make that happen, but we don't have to bite off on establishing that infrastructure for each and every uh, workload in the mesh. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to establish uh, a layer seven policy for this web API identity, okay? And so to do that, we're going to first spin up a waypoint proxy, which is at this point just, a, it's an Envoy proxy, just like, uh, just like the uh, uh, like sidecars are in Istio. That, uh, uh, that's actually going to be the policy enforcement point for, uh, for this policy. So, all right, what does a policy look like? We're gonna do, well, first of all, let's actually, uh, as Marino said, we're gonna use the gateway API to actually spin up that, uh, that waypoint proxy so you can see this gateway, uh, uh, this gateway corresponds to the web API uh, identity uh, service account here. So let's, um, uh, connection closed, the demo gods have struck. I hate it when that happens. All right. Here we go. Did, did you offer your sacrifice to the demo gods this morning, Marino? I, I forgot, uh, that, that's, that's probably what's going on here. All right, so, um, so all right, so we have, we have established that gateway, and uh, if the gods are being kind to us, 
we can look now and we should see that uh, a, a, a waypoint proxy corresponding to this web API service has indeed uh, been, been spun up for us. And now let's actually do something interesting. So, so far we've only been specifying policies that require layer four access. Let's do something that, uh, that introduces a layer seven component, an HTTP component. So we're going to expand out the web API uh, policy so that now uh, we're, using, we're allowing traffic from the same principles as before, but we're only supporting HTTP get methods, all right? So something that requires layer seven access to uh, to be able to enforce. So when we, when we activate that policy, now if we try to do the same thing that we did before, this is gonna work because we're issuing an HTTP GET against the, uh, against the web API, all right? And so that's all, that's all fine, that works. But if we um, try to issue a delete request instead of a GET request, what do you expect to happen? The policy is going to kick in and we're going to get a, a, an access denied uh, message there. You can also see we get back a, because this is at the HTTP level, we also get back a nice um, HTTP 403 uh, forbidden code as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to shut down the demo and turn it back over to Marino to take us home. All right. All right. Yeah, working, perfect. Thank you so much for the demo. Appreciate that, Jim. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, is it like a hidden somewhere? Uh, let me take you back. There, there you go. go. Hit play up there. Nice, okay. So just to recap, Istio, offer, or Istio Ambient Mesh offers you a new mode of operation uh, for a sidecarless operation. So the, the fundamental difference here is that when you roll out services into your mesh with Ambient Mesh, you're not having to deploy a sidecar, which means you're not injecting, you're not having to modify the existing workload, and you're not having to restart it. Uh, you actually tag your, your namespace that you want it to be a part of the ambient mesh um, environment, and once you do so, then the waypoint, sorry, then the Z tunnels get deployed, uh, and then they start um, looking for traffic destined towards other ambient mesh-based workloads. Now, what this means is because we're you know, operating with less sidecars, that means there are less um, resources consumed, but does that mean we lose any capability? No, because we've shifted that operation towards the Z tunnel and the waypoint proxy. If I want layer four authorization, it's there. Layer seven, it's also there, but through that gateway API deployed waypoint proxy. Uh, finally, I wanted to just point out one very interesting thing here. You might have noticed that the Waypoint Proxy as well as the Z Tunnel currently use implementations of Envoy. There is work being done today in the Istio community to change that, that Z Tunnel proxy to be Rust-based so that it could be far more performant. Um, it could also allow us to you know, scale in different ways as well. Um, so you could go check that out. There's actually, if I'm not mistaken, the Istio community has even got a branch for that that you can go check out and even test it out for yourself to understand like, what the performance might look like. Um, in fact, I think one of the Istio contributors also created a very good document um, that just walks through the different um, Envoy, a Go-based proxy, and a Rust-based proxy, and the different performance um, kit metrics that come out of that as well. Finally, I will say, if you, are, if you are interested to play with Ambient Mesh in detail, we have a lab um, that's available through Solo Academy. Go check that out. It's academy.solo.io. Um, we have ambient, me ambient mesh-based uh, workshops. We also have Istio, we have eBPF and Cilium so that you can learn the whole stack for application networking. Also, if you want to continue that conversation about ambient mesh and you have more questions, if we're not able to answer them here, obviously, come visit us at G18. We're, we're in that expo hall somewhere, um, but you can't miss us. So uh, let's open it up to questions. And by okay. the way, we also have giveaways, the ambient mesh book, so we can give you some more details. Yeah. If, you're, if you have a plane ride home like I do, this is great. You can read it, uh, you can read it on the plane on the way home. So yeah, c come, come ask us for one. All right, any questions? Yes, go ahead. So currently as it stands, you can't at the moment only because there hasn't been any sort of, I'd say, configuration or coding or programming for 
let's say, the Istio CNI pod to direct that directly to the waypoint. And in fact, the waypoint is only meant to be deployed when you have to you know, use layer seven authorization. Most of the, tra or all of the traffic should be flowing through the Z tunnel so that it can decide, do we want to tunnel towards a waypoint or directly to another Z tunnel so that we can maintain it. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, there, there could be other options. Um, specifically for Istio, uh, we've gone on the path of using uh, the Z tunnel and then taking advantage of the HBone protocol that, in fact, if you go look at, uh, I think Istio 1.16 now supports, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on this because I gotta go back and check, um, now supports HBone to the sidecar as well. So this means that there's more integration going uh, towards this ambient mesh and non-ambient based workloads that run the sidecar. Um, so the potential of you saying, when, when you just mentioned, hey, could we just go to the, the waypoint, that could be a possibility, and that's something that we could probably feed back to the SDO community to further develop. Is there another question over here? Somewhere? So. so you're having the um, Z tunnel interface with the ID of the workload, right? So that's right. Receiving those specific instances from, I'm guessing the Istio is using that as the intermediary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Take that one, or do you want me to? Okay, so my what I would say is we're not there yet. Well, the SEO community is not yeah. there yet, uh, but that's definitely being investigated. Um, if we could do it with SEO today, I mean, there's no reason we couldn't do it with ambient mesh as well. It's well, just we haven't gone down that path. It work today because the uh, pod is the, the side of the chair that is driven to the overhead DS. Mm -hmm. uh, Envoy's SDS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's available. Not today. In the no. community yeah. yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you very much right. for coming by. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care.